Well, thank you. And thank you for all Dementia Alliance, all you folks there do. And uh, uh, Dr. Bazzocchi's, uh slides were just intriguing. I want to go, I can't wait to get the link and go back through and really study some of those slides uh, because there was lots of good new information on there. And I hope that was helpful to you caregivers. Um, I just want to say hi to you and thank you so much for being here today to learn all that you can about dementia caregiving and specifically Lewy body dementia caregiving. Um, uh, I, in this particular form of, in any form of dementia, but in this particular form of dementia, uh, knowledge is really power. How to manage Lewy body dementia really does empower you as a caregiver. And um, like Lisa said, my husband, John, had Lewy body dementia. He was treated for eight and a half years by Dr. Daniel Coffer, um, whom I loved like a brother eventually and worked with. Uh, he made all the difference in our journey. And I'm thrilled that that Center of Excellence is about to be named uh, for him. Uh, during that time, when we were in, on the journey, I learned a lot about what did and what did not work as a Lewy body dementia caregiver. Now, every patient is different, but there are many commonalities. So when I read the article and I'm basing this talk on uh, today, I recognized it as one of the best ones I had seen since 2007 when John was diagnosed. So this presentation is based, uh, it's an adaptation really on this excellent article from the Family Caregiver Alliance. I've added some simplified ways of expressing the essence of each of these strategies. And I've also added present uh, perspectives on two of them, which speak to issues that I hear a lot in my volunteer work with LBD caregivers. One of those is working with doctors and the other is dealing with the fluctuating symptoms that come in such a pronounced form with Lewy body dementia. But first, before I dive into that, I want to share two messages of hope with you as an LBD caregiver. Let's see if I can get my computer to cooperate. There we go. So here's some hope. Dr. Daniel Coffer told me this somewhere in the middle of the journey, and I asked him one day to repeat it for me over the telephone, and I said, I want to share what you're saying because it's going to bring such hope to caregivers, and here are his words exactly. Lewy body dementia is among the most challenging of all the dementias, but it is the most responsive to the right treatment and management the most responsive. And you don't hear that out there in the world. You can only hear that from someone who is exquisitely qualified to treat this disease and has learned over a long period of time that it is the most responsive. When you're doing it right, when you're managing it right, when they're getting the right meds, when they're avoiding the, the wrong meds, it really does respond well. And I want you to cling to that hope and remember it while you're on your caregiver journey. The other thing I wanted, the other message of hope, uh, in the course of my hundreds of conversations with uh, LBD caregivers, I learned something very interesting. It's like, wow, this keeps coming up. And that is that LBD patients will likely know you, your, their loved ones on the day they leave this earth. Wow, is that not a fantastic thing to hear? It's not Alzheimer's people. It just isn't Alzheimer's. We're dealing with a different animal. So let's figure out how to deal with this animal. Okay, what's our overall goal? Our overall goal as caregivers is a more gentle journey for them, for you, and for your whole family. So here's how this article begins. And it sets, this introduction sets the tone for the whole message of the article. As caregivers, we often use intuition to help us decide what to do. No one ever gave us lessons on how to relate to someone with memory loss. Unfortunately, 
dealing with dementia is counterintuitive. That is, often the right thing to do is exactly opposite that which seems like the right thing to do. So here's some practical advice. And we're going to bring up that word counterintuitive over and over again because you're going to be seeing things that are kind of like you're having to turn it around. But once you figure out how to do that, once you grasp that and hold on to it, life's going to change at your house. So let's dig into some of these strategies. Okay, number one, being reasonable, rational, and logical will just get you into trouble. When someone is acting in ways that don't make sense. We tend to carefully explain the situation, calling on his or her sense of appropriateness to get compliance. However, the person with dementia just doesn't have that boss in his brain any longer. So he doesn't respond to our arguments. No matter how logical, straightforward, simple sentences about what is going to happen are usually the best way to go. So the key here is not to explain, but rather to give brief, clear directions about how to move forward to the next moment. Now that may or may not involve changing the subject entirely. Your goal is to move them to a more gentle place emotionally. Number two, people with dementia do not need to be grounded in reality. That sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? When someone has memory loss, he often forgets important things, like his mother's deceased. So when you remind him of this loss, we remind him about the pain of that loss at the same time. When someone wants to go home, Reassuring him that he is at home often leads to an argument. So redirecting and asking someone maybe to tell you about that person he just asked about. Or let's talk about what your, what was that home like that you grew up in? It's a better way to calm that person with dementia. So we learn to choose redirection over what we know to be reality, or we encourage them to focus on more detail around the topic of their concern, but with a positive twist. And sometimes we might do the reminiscing if they're having trouble remembering. Number three, you cannot be a perfect caregiver. Just as there's no such thing as a perfect parent, there's no such thing as a perfect caregiver. You have the right to the full range of your human emotions, people, and sometimes you're going to be impatient and you're going to be frustrated. So learning to forgive your loved one as well as yourself is essential in the caregiver journey. Number four, therapeutic lying reduces stress. Now in this one, what we're really after is being kind as caregivers. And sometimes total honesty creates too much pain. It's not ultimately the kindest thing to do. Now we tend to be meticulously honest with people, however, Someone, when someone has dementia, honesty can lead to distress for both us and the one we're caring for. Does it really matter that your loved one thinks she's a volunteer at the daycare center? Is it okay to tell your loved one that the two of you are going out to shop and coincidentally you stop by the doctor's office on the way home to pick up something as a way to get her to go to the doctor? So going back to strategy two, that one that says we shouldn't always need to be grounded in reality, this strategy often comes up when our loved ones ask someone who's died. They ask about that person. 
the choice to not be directly honest in this situation is much more kind to the person living with dementia. You might have to say something like, um, I'll check into that. Hmm, yeah, we haven't heard from her for a while. Let me check into that. Or, you know, I haven't seen her lately. Then change the subject. Number five, making agreements doesn't work. If you ask your loved one to not do something ever again, or you ask them to remember to do something, it may soon be forgotten. For people in early stage dementia, leaving notes as reminders can sometimes help, but as the disease progresses, this may not work. So taking action, like rearranging the environment in some way, rather than talking and discussing, is usually a more successful approach. For example, getting a tea kettle with an automatic off switch is better than warning someone of the dangers of leaving the stove on. Being perceptive <clears throat> about what is going on at this point and what is likely to be coming up and then being proactive to get prepared a bit ahead of time will serve you well. Number six, doctors often need to be educated by you. Excuse me. <clears throat> Telling the doctor what you see at home is important. For example, the doctor can't tell during the examination that the night before your loved one was up pacing all night. Sometimes doctors too need to deal with some therapeutic lying and you may need to kind of educate them on that. Like for instance, if they need an antidepressant, the doctor may need to say that it's more for, it's for memory than it is for depression. If you know that's gonna be a trigger for your loved one. Doctors dealing with Lewy body dementia often do need to be educated by you. This is one of the items that I want to expand on a bit for LBD caregivers. The reason is the frequency this comes up in conversations that I have all across the country. Too many doctors simply do not know how to comprehensively manage LBD. And that puts us as the LBD caregiver in a tough spot. We either settle for less than we or our loved ones deserve, or we choose to become proactive and persistent. Okay, let's expand on that a little bit. Remember that you are the coach of this team. Coaches decide who gets to play in the game. And coaches must do their homework and prepare for the game. So don't let white coat syndrome silence you. For those of you who don't know what white coat syndrome is, it's that awe that some people have for doctors to the point that they are just going to silently sit there and take whatever the person in the theoretical white coat is giving them at that point. You got to get over that because too many doctors need more information from you than is typical for a lot of other medical situations. So do your homework so you can ask key questions. This is really important. So you can go into that appointment and ask key questions that can have a really good impact on symptom management. Bring written questions with you. Make a copy for the doctor, a copy for yourself. Have someone with you to take notes and to help you remember key items that need discussion. Our son did this for us and we always found items in his notes that all of us had forgotten from that appointment because these appointments are packed with both details and emotion. So notes really do help and try not to go along to those appointments if you can help it. Remember also that you have the right to be heard, respected, and responded to in a timely fashion. 
a good doctor recognizes that caregiver, you people, as the most important source of accurate information for good patient care. This isn't, this is that long term day in and day out care. You're coming back to those appointments every four to six months. You are the key and a good doctor recognizes you're the key. Coaches, remember, decide who gets to play the game. So if you're dealing with a doctor who's not listening to you, you they just won't respond. They seem to not disrespect you. It's easy to fire a doctor. You just don't come back. You hire a doctor by making appointment. You fire a doctor by not coming back. Now, what I want to share with you now is a perfect description of the LBD doctor that you want and the one that you don't want. And I'm using someone else. I'm using one of the best LBD doctors in the country's words to describe that to you. I'm going to read Dr. Bradley Bavay's letter to physicians that he wrote on behalf of the Lewy Body Dementia Association Scientific Advisory Council. This is a group of the world's best Lewy Body Dementia physicians. Dr. Bavay practices at the Mayo Clinic, and she is a co he is a colleague of, of Dr. Bazzocchi's, who gave that wonderful talk right before me. Uh, Dr. Bovet is known for his extensive research into Lewy body dementia and for his extremely high quality of care that he gives to those patients and their families. Now, I think you're going to recognize his passion for getting the right kind of care for our loved one in the words I'm about to read to you. I encourage you to copy this letter and share it with medical providers that you encounter this choice will spread knowledge across the medical community, one provider at a time. If enough of us do this, over time, LBD care should improve. I remember Dr. Daniel Coffer telling me that, that we are, we are part of the, the army that's out there educating everybody we can on Lewy body dementia. The more educated they get, the better the care goes up. So the title for his letter is a comprehensive book comprehensive approach to treatment can significantly improve the quality of life of life of patients with Lewy body dementias. And here we go. His words, Lewy body dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, is not preventable or curable. But by focusing on what we can do, rather than what we cannot do, there is much that can be done to allow your patients to enjoy a higher quality of life. Remember, he's writing to physicians. In fact, LBD patients tend to have greater cholinergic deficits, but less neuronal loss than Alzheimer's patients. So there's more potential for improvement and or stabilization using the cholinesterase inhibitors. By the way, for those of you who don't know, that's like the Aricepts and the Exelon, the Nepazil and the Rivastigmine. Additionally, there are good medications for many of the behavioral features of LBD. He continues, in our experience, these are the physicians who are the experts on LBD. In our experience, many LBD patients enjoy significant improvement with a comprehensive approach to therapy addressing cognitive, neuropsychiatric, motor, sleep, autonomic, and other medical issues. And many have markedly little change from year to year. Clearly, not all patients experience this improvement and slowly progressive course, but for many LBD patients, especially those with little atrophy on the MRI, the neurotransmitter deficit appears to drive the illness more than neuronal death. Such patients can improve with therapy, sometimes markedly, and do quite well, all things considered, for many, many years. 
Perhaps it's the lack of this comprehensive approach that many have not seemed to benefit. Perhaps there are biologic differences between different patient populations that lead to differences in the clinical course. We in the LBDA firmly believe an aggressive and comprehensive approach is necessary with LBD patients, especially early in the illness, and some clinicians may not take that approach. It pains us greatly to think of the LBD patients who see physicians who have the all too frequent view that, quote, this patient has dementia, none of the drugs work, so there's little to do, so get your finances in order and plan for a painful next few years when you won't recognize your family, will need to live in the nursing home, yada, 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 end of quote. I have to stop right here. We heard this almost verbatim from doctor number 11 in our journey who properly diagnosed LBD and said almost those exact words. And he was at one of the most prestigious universities in this country. Doctor number 12 was Dr. Coffer, by the way. Okay, let's keep going with Brad Beauvais words. This is the view of so many doctors, including neurologists and psychiatrists. And it is our, the LBD specialist obligation to educate the public and the medical community that LBD is very different than Alzheimer's disease. And it is absolutely unacceptable to do nothing or to take a nihilistic approach. We must also maintain realistic optimism since there is almost always something we doctors can do to affect quality of life through medications, education, counseling, and behavioral modification, et cetera. Encourage your patients, caregivers, to become good detectives by carefully studying and identifying medications and other interventions or environmental factors that influence the LBD patient's function and fluctuations. And the last slide says, we are seeking to promote knowledge and understanding that LBD is a relatively common form of dementia. LBD is recognizable to the educated eyes. LBD can respond to cholinesterase inhibitor plus or minus psychostimulant therapy, sometimes dramatically. LBD should not be exposed to conventional neuroleptics and quality of life for patients and families can be reasonably good for many years. Okay, folks, did you hear it? Did you recognize the right doctor and the wrong doctor? Let's look at that for a minute. How do we recognize the right doctor? That's the doctor who either already knows how to treat LBD or is humble and wise enough to learn how to treat LBD. And that can be a primary care physician sometimes. Happens a lot in the people I talk to. We recognize the right doctor as someone who listens to you, the caregiver, and who works with you as a team member. The right doctor knows what medications to avoid or give with caution. That's a huge thing in the management of LBD. What do you avoid? What do you give with caution and really are careful about? Sometimes you give those medicines, sometimes they work, but you give them with caution and you alert the caregiver and work with the caregiver as a good team member in doing that. The right doctor knows, and these are my additions here, and this, but this is not mine, I'm sorry. This is what Dan Coffer taught me. He said, Pat, no matter what, only Make one medication change at a time. Rule of thumb, never do two things at a time. One at a time, because then you have one variable to look at, that or else some intervening uh, uh, disease that comes in, some kind of infection or environmental thing. 
but you only have one medication variable. Very, very important. And I talk to people whose doctors are just taking away two and giving them two. No, one at a time. And you insist on that as coach of the team. The next thing you have to know, the right doctor is going to know this low and slow method for medicating someone who has Lewy body dementia. You start at a very low dose, the lowest possible dose, and you titrate up very slowly. You do not rush medicine. You don't rush taking it away a lot of times, and you don't rush introducing it low and slow. That's what the right doctor looks like. Now, I'm going to share something else. Um, and I, su I suggest if you have a camera right now and you can take a screenshot of this page right here, it is one of the most brilliant things I have ever seen um, done. Um, and this was also done by Dr. Bradley Bove because on one chart, he basically lays out for you and for a physician, the types of medicines to treat a lot of the variable symptoms, which ones to be careful about and which ones you can be optimistic about giving. So I encourage you to take a screenshot of this chart to share with your doctor and to keep for your own reference going forward. It's one of the most important charts that, like I said, I've ever seen. It helps clarify the very complex task of medication management of LBD. It is also found at the end of the first video link of HELPS at the end of this talk, I'm going to give you a slide that has helps on it, and it's at the end of that brilliant 20-minute uh, video. You may find yourself in the emergency room or in a hospital room one day with doctors who have little experience with proper LBD management. I hope you have a copy of this chart to use in those situations. And this is an example of when you're on the front line of LBD education with medical professions. It's gonna, it's gonna happen to you when you're with nurse practitioners, with physicians, with ER doctors, with hospitalists, uh, as well as the people you may encounter who are in maybe in primary care world or even with neurologists. This is gonna be something that's very helpful. I hope you'll use that tool. Now. Where do you find the right doctor? Okay, here are some places to find the right LBD doctor. You can Google LBDA Research Centers of Excellence, like I have there, R-C-O-E in quotations. You can call the helpline at LBDA at that number. Uh, and you can do what you're doing right now. You can uh, network with support group members, uh, either locally or online. Uh, and they may know someone who is the best doctor in your area for a loved one's type of uh, dementia. Uh, this week, uh, help someone find somebody over in the uh, Asheville area by tapping into a um, support group that I'm involved with. And someone from that area had had a wonderful experience um, with LBD management with this doctor. And I didn't know that doctor's name before that. So please use your contacts. It makes a big difference. Okay, now I've expanded on that one. So let's scoot through the other strategies as we move along here. Uh, number seven, you can't do it all. We're back to those strategies as a caregiver. You cannot do it all. When people offer to help, the answer that you give should always be yes. Have a list of things that people can do to help you, whether it's bringing a meal or picking up a prescription or helping trim your roses or staying with your loved one while you go and run an errand. This will reinforce offers for more help. It's harder to ask for help than it is to accept it when it's offered. So don't wait until you really need it to get support. A lot of us do that, including me. I did the same thing. You've got to get help. It's easy to burn out when you try to do it all yourself. So begin building a team that includes medical and therapeutic support, counseling, practical daily helpers as soon as you can. You are just as important as your loved one, people. If you crash, they crash with you. 
So accept that you need help and act on that. Okay, number eight, it's easy to over or underestimate what your loved one can do. It's often easier to do something for our loved ones than to let them do it for, for themselves. However, if we do it for them, they may lose the ability to be independent in that skill. On the other hand, if we insist individuals do something and they just cannot do it, they're going to get frustrated and we just make our loved ones agitated and probably haven't increased their abilities to perform tasks. Not only is this a constant struggle to find that balance, but be aware that the balance may shift from day to day, so be flexible. Number nine, tell, don't ask. Asking, what would you like for dinner? May have been perfectly normal question at another time, but now we're asking our loved one to come up with an answer when he or she may not have the words right then for what they want. They might not be hungry. Or even if they do answer, they might not want the food when it's served after all. Saying we're going to eat now encourages that person to eat and doesn't put them in the dilemma of having failed to respond. When you do need to ask them a question or, or just want to because of the situation, simplify it when you can. For example, do you want to wear this blue shirt or this red shirt? Or do you want chicken or barbecue? Giving a choice between two things is much easier than an open-ended question. And here is our last strategy. Uh, it's normal to question the diagnosis when they have moments of lucidity. Um, we have to remember that fluctuation is the name of the game with LBD for sure. So this is going to happen a lot more often and earlier and throughout the disease. So everyone with dementia has times when they make perfect sense and they can respond appropriately. We often feel like the person has been faking it or we've been exaggerating the problem when those moments occur. We're not imagining things. They're just having one of those moments to be treasured when they occur. So turn those fluctuations to your advantage. This is the second strategy that I want to expand on a bit. Turn the fluctuations to your advantage. Knowing that things will fluctuate with LBD will equip you to not be confused, make you realize that diagnosis was correct, and allow you to turn those fluctuations to your advantage. When Louie is acting up, your job is to minimize the impact. When there's a negative behavior, don't feed the monster. The monster's name is Louie. Don't feed the monster. Leave the room. Redirect the conversation. Do not get drawn into an argument. Remember, it's pretty hard for one person to have an argument all by themselves. So just refuse to get drawn in. Get out of there and give yourself time to reset with your emotions and for them to reset as well. One of the hardest things to do is to remember that we're responding to a disease, not the person who has it. I call this personifying Louie. You separate the disease from the person, you love and nurture that person, and you outsmart Louie. When your loved one is more present, stop everything and maximize the joy. Build memories for yourself. With LBD, fluctuations can be by the minute, by the hour, by the day, or by the season. And because it happens now, with LBD doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen later or at the same intensity if it does come back. 
So try to stay in the moment. One of the most important things our counselor taught us in our journey was to stay in the moment. He had to repeat it over and over again. But we practice it often, and it made the experience of the disease softer. Oh, my goodness, I can remember Dan Coffer's words. There's the disease, he said, and then there's the experience of the disease. Whew, what wisdom. Now, one more word about fluctuations. They will likely know you at the end. Remember, that's one of the best ones. So create as many moments of joy as you can and make that a priority. Let me turn my phone off to set it. Make that a priority. Remembering that our overall goal is a more gentle journey. So minimize disease impact and maximize joy. Learn all you can to outsmart Louie. Taking the good moments and magnifying them. Stop everything and be, just be in those moments. I'm so grateful that I have a lot of memories of those moments because I didn't answer the telephone like the one that just rang. I just refused to answer it and I was just with him and it was wonderful. Okay, let's share some of the helps. Um, I did forget to put on this that uh, a long time ago in 2012, uh, I did write a book called uh, Treasures in the Darkness, for those of you who don't know that, and you can find that on Amazon.com. Uh, the subtitle is Extending the Early Stage of Lewy Body Dementia, and uh, Dr. Coffer asked me to write it, and then he wrote the forward for it. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can find that on Amazon, Treasures in the Darkness. Okay, here are some really good specific ones to this message. Uh, the medication management for symptoms of LBD is a brilliant 20-minute video explaining how to medically manage the various symptoms. Uh, some of you have seen my video, The Five Moving Parts of Lewy Body Dementia, and he talks about the medications that can address those five moving parts. Uh, and he even adds in the visual part of it, which uh, I kind of collapsed into one of my five parts. And so that I highly recommend that you look at. Uh, you can find these on my YouTube video. If you go down to this bottom set of red letters, if you'll Google YouTube, Pat Snyder Dementia. Um, and then once you get, that'll take you to my channel and then click playlist at the top of the page. Uh, his uh, uh, Brad Bavay's video is the number four in my playlist. It's the best thing I've ever seen in one place. How he did it in 20 minutes, I don't know. And at the very end of it is that multicolored chart that I was telling you about. Um, and then Lewy Body Dementia Association puts out a wonderful booklet called Diagnosing and Managing Lewy Body Dementia. It is designed by physicians for physicians, but you can still purchase it online for no dollars. You can go to the resources and find that in the list. And um, and it won't cost you anything. They will mail you a paper copy or you can print your own if you go to this link uh, and you'll be able to find that link also at the lbda.org site. Uh, but here's the longer list if you want to um, to use that. Um, I want to thank you for your time listening today. I hope this has helped you in your journey. Um, but most of all, let me say this. What you're doing is so important. It's probably some of the most important thing you will do in your life. It's changing you. And if you will just learn to separate that disease and love and nurture that loved one and outsmart Louie, at the end of this thing, you're going to like yourself better. And I Thank you. Thank you for every day. I'm not sure you get to hear that as a caregiver, so I want to be sure you hear it today. Thank you for what you're doing. It's changing the world. It's making all the difference. 
Thanks so much. And thanks for your time.